Hi, Happy New Year, welcome to 2020. So I thought we'd do something slightly different today. What I've done is gone through the highs forum posts for the last year or so and picked out those issues that people keep bringing up time and time again, especially new users. So I'm going to go through my top five things that keep reappearing on the highs forum and show you the quickest solution to those things. Okay, the first issue I see is one where people try to export a plugin and they're hit with a message that pops up and says the highs path is not set. So I have a blank project here, it's just got an interface script and nothing else. If I go to export and select export as instrument, we're going to get this pop-up, highs path not set. So this is really easy to fix. What highs is looking for here is the highs source code, so that's the source code you use to actually compile highs itself. And it needs that because your compiled plugin will also use some of that source code. You'll need your source code folder, which you should have downloaded from GitHub. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, there's other videos on my channel which explain all about that. And you'll end up with a folder like this. This is the high source code folder. And then all you need to do is in your project, go to File, Preferences, and scroll down to this bit where it says Highs Path. This is in the compiler settings. Click on Browse and go to where you have the high source code. And then hit OK and, and now the path is correct, it's in there, that's the high source code path. So that's the path to this folder, it's the same as this path up there. And if we go to export and export as an instrument now, we don't get that message and it goes on to the next stage which is validating um, sample references. Okay, the second issue I see coming up quite often is how to hide combo box arrows. So let's add a combo box. I think I even asked this on the forum a couple of times. So there's a combo box and we can see, let's zoom in on this. So we can see there's a couple of arrows there at the right hand side. And as always, we can customize the look of this control uh, to some degree using the um, property window, uh, the property editor over here. And we can hide the arrows, but we also hide the text. And we do that by changing the text color. So that's usually not what you want to do because you usually want to show the text, but just hide the arrows. Now there are several ways we could do this. We could redraw the combo box entirely using paint routines. We could replace the combo box with a panel and again use paint routines. But I'm just gonna show you the simplest method. And that is to place the combo box inside a panel and then make the panel slightly smaller than the combo box. So let's add a panel to our interface. And we're gonna put the, whoop, let's bring that back. We're gonna put the combo box inside the panel. So the first thing to do is make sure the panel has the same height as the combo box. The combo box has a height of 32, so we'll do the same with the panel. And then all we have to do is make the panel um, less wide than the combo box and it will hide the buttons. So we can do that by actually entering a value in here. We can adjust this slider here if we want, or we can hold shift on the keyboard and use the arrow keys to change the size of the panel, which is what I'm going to do now. If it'll work, there we go. So this is really handy for resizing controls. So you just hold the shift key and press an arrow key. And there we go, those buttons are now hidden. So the last thing is we have this weird border stuff going on underneath our combo box. And that's because the panel has some properties of its own. So we've got background color. I'm just gonna clear all of these out. Background color, item color, text color, and we'll set the border size to zero border radius to zero and hit compile and there we go now we've just got our combo box and we can't see the panel now this is great especially if you've only got a few combo boxes it's a really fast technique if you're going to have multiple combo boxes in a row um, one thing you can do is you could extend the um, panel like this so this is this is for several combo boxes stacked on top of each other So we could do something like that. 
and just make sure they're all spaced correctly. So this is a really handy thing to do because now we're only using one extra control, one panel, but we're hiding the arrows on several combo boxes. So that's a really quick way to hide the arrows on combo boxes. Okay, so next we've got number three, which is inverting the value of a control. And I've seen this one come up quite a lot. So we'll start with buttons. So let's just add a button to our interface and we'll get a control callback. There we go. And let's just uh, print to the console what the value is. So the button's off, when I click it, it's going to turn the button on and we get one printed to the console. And if I click it again, it'll turn the button off and print zero. So off is zero, on is one. But if you want to flip the value around, if you want to invert the value, all you need to do is subtract the value of the button from the maximum value that the button can have. So a button can either be zero or one. So its maximum value is one. So all we need to do is in here, we just put one and then the minus sign. So we're doing, we're, we're subtracting the value from one. So I'll hit compile again. Let's clear that out. So now the button's off. I'm going to click it. It's going to turn on, but the value we'll see printed is going to be zero. And now when I turn it off, we're going to see one, whereas before we were seeing zero. So that's a really quick way to invert a button just subtract the value from its maximum value. Okay, let's have a look at how we can do this with a slider. So I'll add a slider to the interface and we'll give that a maximum value of 100. And again, we'll get a control callback. So we'll console print the value to the console again, so we can see what its current value is. So it goes from zero to a hundred, back down to zero. So we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to take the maximum value of the knob and subtract the current value from it. So we could do it in two ways. We could type in 100 and minus the value. So the same as we did for the button. And now when it's at the minimum, we get the maximum value. And when the knob's at the maximum, we get the minimum value. So that's a quick way to do it. But if you want to use this and make it more um, modular, more reusable, and you don't necessarily know the maximum value the knob's going to have, what you can do is you can get the max property through your script. And the way we do that is we type the name of the control and then use the get function and pass in the property max. So I'll make a little local variable here called max. And this is going to be equal to knob one dot get max. And then we can replace one here with max. Uh, unknown function get. Oh, that's because I haven't actually made a script variable declaration. So let's just do that. There we go. So I was referring to knob one here, but of course we didn't have a variable for it. Now we do. So again, that should work just fine. Yeah. That's good. And one more thing we can do, we're still actually using the name of the variable here, which is um, quite specific. It doesn't make this function very generic. So we don't have to use the name because we have this value here, component, which refers to the control already. So we can just change that to component. And now we don't need that declaration. And if I hit compile, the result should be the same. So the max we're getting zero and at the min we're getting 100. So the same principle we use for the button, just subtract the value from the controls maximum value. So number four, I've seen come up in a few different contexts, but it's basically people asking, how do you filter notes? So either how do you allow certain notes to come through or how do you prevent certain notes from coming through? So let's have a look at how we can do that. So in order to filter notes, I'm going to add a second script below our interface script, and this could be part of a sampler or a, another module, but for now I'm just going to put it here. And all I'm going to do in here is print out the note number. So 
So now when I play a key on my keyboard, we'll just see the note number printed out in the console. Okay, so we can see what notes are getting through and which notes aren't getting through. That's the idea behind this. Okay, so it's so simple to filter out notes. So we have our on note on callback. Let's say we want to ignore the notes, uh, I don't know, let's say C3, which is note 60, to C4, which is note 72. So that's going to be our range that we're going to ignore. So the first thing we need to do is get the note number that's coming in. So we'll just store that in a local variable. Call it N. And you don't have to do this, it just makes it a bit easier to write it because we don't have to keep writing out message.getNote number every time. And then we're going to check if the note number, if n, is within our range of 60 to 72. So first of all, we're going to check if it's greater than or equal to 60. And is it less than or equal to 72? So if it is, that means it's within, it's between C3 and C4. And now we can decide what we want to do. So we're going to ignore these notes. So to ignore these notes, we just put message dot ignore event true. And I'll hit F5 on that. So now I'm going to play on my keyboard. And you can see over here on the on-screen keyboard, it's a little small, but hopefully you can see uh, which keys I'm pressing down. So I'm pressing key 59 now. Now I'm going to press middle C, which is C60, and we shouldn't see anything output in the console. There we go, and I'm going all the way up through that octave, all the way up to C4, and now I'm on D4, and it's picking it up again. So that's a really easy way to filter out notes. Now usually you wouldn't want to hard code these numbers. You'd put them in variables or have some knobs on the interface or something to select them. There's various ways to do that. Now, the other version of this is, let's say you only want to allow those notes, you want to ignore everything else. Well, that's easy as well. All we have to do is change these operators. So instead of saying, is it greater than or equal to 60, we can just say, is it less than 60? And instead of the and, we need to put an or. And instead of saying, is it less than or equal to 72, we can just say, is it greater than 72? So we're saying, is it less than 60 or is it greater than 72? If it is, ignore it. Anything else in the middle will pass through. So we'll compile that. So I'm going to press D4 again. So that's above 72. And we're not getting anything there. Now I'm going to press 72. And we're going to go all the way through that octave, all the way down to C3. And then carry on down. And again, everything is ignored after that. So a really simple way to um, either allow notes through or to not allow notes through. And this technique extends to velocity as well. So we could do that with velocity. So if we want to allow velocities greater than uh, 60, for example, we could say um, is v less than 60 and if it is it'll be ignored so i'll hit f5 so now i'm going to play a note and i'm playing it really softly and now i'm going to play it harder so that's a really simple way to filter notes by velocity or by note number and of course you can combine the two together as well okay and number five this is the one I see come up again and again and again. This is people saying, my control callback isn't working. Now, other than somebody actually just doing something wrong, like making a typo or something, the usual reason for this is they have their control set to use parameter ID, and then they're trying to use a callback as well. So let's set up a situation like that. So we're going to add something to the interface. Let's just add an ADSR or something. What do we have? Um, I'll tell you what, we'll add a, an EQ filter. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to put a knob on the interface to control frequency. So what's the range of that? 20k, of course. So let's do that. So this is going to control frequency. And we're going to connect it up 
to that filter using the processor ID and then the parameter ID to select the frequency. So now if we go back to the front end, we now have this knob on our interface that controls the frequency of the filter. And that's great, but now sometimes you might want it to do something else. And this comes up a lot. So somebody has a control controlling something like a filter, and then they want it to also do something else. In our case, we're just going to get it to output the value in the console, but you might have it do something more interesting than this. So we'll just get it to print its output to the console. I'll hit F5 and now I'm going to move this knob. And as we can see, nothing appears in the console, but it still moves the um, frequency of the filter. So basically the way the highs callback system works, you can either use processor ID to link up a control to something if you just need it to control one thing, or you can use a control callback. You can't use both. So it's one or the other. And then I tell people that, and then they say, but how do I get it to do two things then? Does that mean I can only have it doing one thing? I can't have it controlling my filter and print into the console. You can have both, but you have to script both. If you want it to do more than one thing, it has to be scripted. So let's look at how we do that. So the first thing to do is we need to clear out this processor ID stuff. So we'll just click the blank option at the top and that clears it out. So it's no longer connected to the filter, but it will print out to the console. And now we've got to connect it back up to the filter, but in our script. So we take a reference to the module we want to connect it up to, so the filter. So I'm just right clicking on the filter and I'm going to select create generic script reference. And we'll just paste that in. There we go. We've got a, a reference to the filter now. Then in our, in our callback for the knob, we need to set the frequency of the filter here. So we type filter one dot set attribute. And then it wants the parameter index and we can get that also from filter one. So we just type filter one dot and then if we go through this list until we find the one we want frequency and then we just pass it the value and again that value is being passed in to our callback here that's just the value of the knob and now i'll hit compile and now if we go back to our front interface we should have both things happening so i should move this knob and it should move the frequency and output it to the console So it's just a tiny little change you've got to make, two extra lines of code in this case, and you can um, get your control to do multiple things. And it doesn't have to be limited to two things, of course, you could have it controlling as many as you want. But it's just important to remember that rule, either use processor ID and parameter ID, or use a callback, you can't have both. Okay, so that's all I've got for you today. I hope you found this helpful and I hope these tips will come in um, handy for you. If you've got any questions or comments or suggestions, leave them below the video on YouTube or send me a message on uh, Patreon. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, there's a link in the video description. I post something on Patreon at least once a week and uh, of course I put videos on there every month. I hope you have a great new year and let me know what projects you guys are working on. I'm always interested to see what uh, other people are creating. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.